That's the next question we're answering today in today's sermon. You know, um, only Elmo and Peter Pan stay the same. And uh, if you like Sesame Street, my kids never liked Sesame Street growing up. Uh, n- neither did I. I. I guess I passed it down to them. But um, I remember um, Elmo's favorite uh, song. You guys remember Elmo's song? La 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 la. La, 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 Elmo's song, remember that? And uh, what, about, what about Peter Pan's song? That's kind of a, a, an older one, I think. And um, it goes something like this. I don't want to grow up, or I, I how, does it, how, 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 how does it go? I won't grow up. I don't want to go to school just to learn to be a parrot and recite a silly rule. Some of you might remember that song. But the reality is that we all do grow up, um, and uh, um, you know it's uh, and, and we do want to grow up, and we do grow up, and it's just a matter sometimes of what do you end up growing up to become, and of course today's question is how in the world do I grow up spiritually? Spiritually, it seems at times that we get up in the middle of the church, or we're uh, uh, or we're put in the middle of the church after we we've been baptized, in a matter of speaking, of course, and. Um, still wet in the ears, and, and, and then we're told, more or less, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. By the way, we're going to be singing that at the end of the service today. Read your Bible every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Not actually, not a bad song. It's a very good song, as a matter of fact. Very simple, but very, very profound. It's very, very true. Um, but mostly at church, we seem to just learn by osmosis. Um, and nobody really sits down. It seems like, you know, we take the time, at least when I was, you know, when I got myself ready or when I was being prepared for, um, for baptism, it took months for me to actually go through the baptismal studies. And, and then after that, I was practically on my own. <laughs> nobody really sits, sat down with me. Nobody really truly sits down with us and tells us just exactly how. We are going to grow with God spiritually. How do we grow spiritually? This is an excellent question. Today's sermon answers this important question, or at least attempts to answer this question biblically from Scripture. And, and um, today's answer comes on the heels of last Sabbath sermon. Now, I don't expect you, and I'm not asking you to remember last week's sermon. Even I don't remember last week's sermon. Halfway through the week, I've already forgotten my own sermon. So I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm trying to do, however, is to alert you to the, to the fact that today's sermon builds uh, on, on the answer that, uh, that was given to last, last week's question. And what was uh, last week's question? Well, last week's question was this. Why can't I hear you at all? That is, why can't I hear God at all when I am trying to? And my purpose for bringing up even last sermon, last Sabbath sermon, is to repeat last week's main point, which is this. By understanding what God's still small voice is and how it comes to us, in our own thoughts and in our own perceptions and even in our, in our, in our own feelings, we can know with, with confidence what God is thinking in real time. That is the main point um, that I want you to remember at least from last, from last week's sermon. This main point, as a matter of fact, is the seed, as it were, uh, the kernel, the basis of today's sermon and the answer to today's sermon. It is the basis of your spiritual growth and my spiritual growth in God, in Jesus Christ. This is what we will unpack today uh, in an answer to the question, as a teen, how do I grow spiritually with God? I'm really, really pleased that our, our young people are asking deep questions, profound questions that we ourselves as adults have been asking for a long time. How do we, how do we grow spiritually with God? So I want to begin, uh, you know, just, just, you know, just, just um, do this uh, uh, quickly. And so let's, let's begin. I want to, once again, offer four things that we can um, um, mull over or uh, think about as we go home today. If, and if you have 
Uh, if you have a pen and a paper, uh, make, sh make sure to be writing these four points down. There are many more, of course. Oh, I, I, I assume I, 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 um, I, I assume that we can say about how we can grow spiritually. There are different ways we can approach this. As a matter of fact, this week, I, you know, um, uh, Jeff Pearson and I went out to lunch, and I shared this uh, question to him uh, this week, and I said, hey, Jeff, how would you answer this, uh, this if you were the one preaching the sermon today? And he gave some pretty good answers, three points, as a matter of fact, and uh, two of them I still remember. I don't remember the, me the middle point. Um, and, and they're actually cautions or, or warnings to all of us, and two, two of those things were pretty, pretty profound. He says, well, it really is a mystery. Come to think of it, we really cannot, whatever we say here today, I don't want you to get the impression that we can come up with some magic formula that if you do this and this and this, it'll happen. The reality is, it is a mystery. At the end of the day, we can really say, and, and we don't have to be afraid to say or ashamed or embarrassed to say, that spiritual growth is God's territory, and because he is mysterious, the process itself has some measure, or in great measure, is, is mysterious. Let's not be ashamed of that. Let us not be embarrassed of that fact. And the, the last thing that I remember Jeff saying is that let's be kind to ourselves along the way as we struggle to grow. Because growth doesn't happen on, a, on an upward trajectory, trajectory all the time. It's a bumpy ride. It's a bumpy ride. And sometimes we have, you know, we... we, we um, digress or we you know regress in order or an even plateau in order for God to be able to catapult us to a, a new series uh, a new time of growth so so let's begin I said four things what's the first thing that we can uh, that, that needs to happen uh, uh, for us to grow uh, spiritually and here's the first the first thing all right first thing is this we grow up spiritually with God when we learn to think with Jesus in real time. Now, this isn't as hard as we might think. The fact is that God gave our brains the ability to be able to synchronize with another person's mind faster than we can even think consciously. Relational, um, r relational neurobiology uh, refers to this ability sometimes as mutual mind. And I mentioned that briefly towards the end of my sermon last week. And these neuro neuroscientists tell us that this ability for two minds to, to be in synchrony with, with each other, and by the way, it happens not by word, uh, not, uh, not at the speed of conscious thought, it happens by sight. As, we, as our mind reads the person in front of us and the body and the face, mainly the face of the person in front of us and also the body language of the person in front of us. And at the speed twice as fast, over twice as fast as conscious thought. And my mic is off. It's not off. It's actually, I'm out of battery. So I'll just be tethered to this mic. It's too late for the battery. Thank you, Larry. Where was I, Larry? Conscious no, mind. Conscious mind. No, you just broke my... Uh, um. All right. Well, I was, think, I was saying that, you know, um, the, the, the speed at which mutual mind interacts with each other blows you away. Because it's, it actually moves, it, it moves faster than we can think consciously. Over twice as fast. Just by looking at somebody's face. It blows you away. And scientists tell us, and these are new and new uh, um, research coming out, they're, they're telling us that it, this, this mutual mind, the ability to be able to, to be in synchrony with somebody's mind, your mind with somebody's mind, just by looking at that person's face, develops as early as five months. And even perhaps younger than that. So if you ever see your children parallel playing, they're actually engaged in mutual mind with each other. Yesterday, my family and I were in mutual mind as well. As we realized and as we planned, we were plan actually we planned this on Thursday. My, my, my daughter texts me and says, uh, with, with 
all you know, cap letters, which means that she's really excited over the question. And she says, Dad, when is mom's birthday? And I says, tomorrow? Tomorrow? Yes. We should go for a walk. She loves to go for a walk. And so we planned this. And so I said, I said to, to my daughter, text your brother and tell him that, he, uh, that, that Friday needs to be free for family time. And so quickly, the three of us got on, into mutual mind mode because it's m- the two things that mommy loved. She, loved, she loves to be with, 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 with the three of us, all of us together, and she loves to go for a walk. And so on Friday, after I had spent a few minutes, or a few, not a few minutes, a few hours working on today's sermon, I said, all right, I'm ready, let's go. And so we went down to, um, where is this? Hidden Falls, beautiful place, and we were there, we were walking, and you could, just, you could just sense, we weren't really saying much to each other, we were, yes, but we, we were engaged in mutual mind with each other, we knew what we were doing together, and we understood each other's minds, not even saying a word to each other. We grow up spiritually with God when we learn to think like that, with Jesus, in real time. That's how we grow. Two minds can synchronize in thought, not just in thought, as a matter of fact, in emotion, and also in energy. If you're ever looking for a way to energize yourself and to get yourself motivated, mutual mind is the answer, as we will find out later on in the sermon. Synchronizing the thought, emotion, energy, at the speed more than twice as fast as your conscious thought can think. And can travel. In 2018, twin brothers, Daniel and Dylan, were born at 25 weeks, too, way too early to be born. Preemies, early second uh, trimester of their mom's pregnancy. Not a fun time to be born into the world. Daniel weighed only a pound and a half, um, about the, you know, as, 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 as heavy as, as, as this iPad. And Daniel... Um, or, or, or did I say Daniel? Yes, Daniel weighed only a pound and a half, about the weight of my iPad Pro. And Dylan, slightly older by a few, minute, by a few minutes, um, you know, managed to come out at two pounds. Still very, very small. They were both extremely weak. Um, um, and, and so they ended up in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit for about a month in separate um, 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 what would I call this now? Uh, incubator. incubator. That, that, is, that is it. You know, you know, we have doctors. I'm not a very medical person. I forget these things. Um, so for a month, they were there together in separate incubation, incub- incubators. And, uh, but Daniel uh, still couldn't uh, breathe on his own after one month, whereas Dylan got out of there in a month's time. He chunked it up uh, quite a bit, and, and then he got out of there in, in a month's time. Uh, but, but, but Daniel was too weak, and he kept losing weight. Can you imagine losing weight at 1.5 pounds after a couple of months? And so one day the head doctor of the hospital took the parents aside and Daniel was, wasn't going to make it, uh, he says. And he advised the parents to say their goodbyes. Daniel was really on his way out. And so they were shocked and they were really, really sad. And so they started to say their, their goodbyes. And the following day, the parents of Dylan and Daniel brought Dylan to see Daniel for the last time. They laid Daniel down in the incubator beside his brother, Daniel. Then something totally unexpected happened. Dylan put his arm on Daniel's shoulder and embraced him. And they were locked in this what seemed like an eternal embrace for about five minutes. Here's a picture of them. And suddenly, out of the blue, Daniel started to improve. And he started to regain his strength. In just a few hours, the doctors transferred Daniel from 100% forced oxygen supply to 50%. And so they all had hope, and you know, some fleeting hope at least. It gave the parents some, some measure of hope that day. But it lasted only that day. The joy didn't last too long. The following day, uh, the parents got a, a call from the hospital saying that uh, Daniel's condition had worsened again. 
And so they were preparing for the inevitable again. But when the parents heard this, you know, uh, the mom says, you know, I know exactly what to do. And so, you know, they, what they did was they rushed back to the hospital with Dylan, with Dylan, and put Dylan back in his brother's incubator. Dylan, once again, embraced his brother, and Daniel, once again, improved. The doctors and nurses kept Dylan in Daniel's incubator for five days. And after the, after the fifth day, Daniel was taken off the ventilator. And this made headline news. In a few weeks' time, Daniel went home with Dylan. This is a true story. And we ask ourselves this question, could Dylan and Daniel have experienced mutual mind this early? Could it have happened? Scripture tells us, Scripture tells us that our transformation is dependent on the renewal of our mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And we are told further that, in th- that this renewal, that we, that, that this renewal uh, is, 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 is something uh, along these lines, that we start reflecting the mind of Christ. It's just not any old renewal of the mind. Okay? It is directly involved, or uh, it, it's, it's directly, it has something to do with reflecting the mind of Christ. We start thinking like Jesus. We start to see people. We start to see events and circumstances in our life. The way Jesus would look at these things. And we respond as Jesus would respond. Filled with love and joy and peace. That's what it looks like in real life. To really grow spiritually in, in, in God through Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says... Um, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. But there's more. There, there's more. The mind of Christ is not some impersonal, abstract idea that we learn by memorizing cards. No, it is, in fact, Jesus himself, the person speaking to us in his still, small voice, coming to us in our own thoughts. It is, in fact, this that is the catalyst for our spiritual transformation. It is Jesus thinking with us and responding with us in real time as we face the different things that we face. It is thinking and responding like Jesus when we tank our exam. It is thinking and feeling like Jesus when we're being bullied at school. It is thinking and feeling like Jesus when we're alone at night with our own devices. It is thinking and feeling like Jesus Christ when we are being decimated by gossip. Or we've had a long day at work and our patience has all but worn out. And it's, it's even more than that. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, we find these amazing words. It's, it says, For who can understand the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? And note this, it says, But we have, that's by actually present tense, continuous. We have the mind of Christ. That is to say, That Jesus' mind is not something that we put on and take off. It's with us all the time. But there is a catch here. There is a catch. Jesus thinks with us not in our conscious thoughts. Not in the conscious thoughts where everything is slow. Often or sometimes called as the slow track of our mind. There are two tracks to our minds apparently. As uh, neuroscientists tell us, there's the fast track and there's the slow track. 
okay? And mutual mind happens not in the slow track, but in the fast track. This mutual mind state happens, as relational neurobiologists would tell us, it happens in the fast track of our mind, which is over, as I said, over twice as fast as conscious thought. Which leads us, leads us to the second point. And here's the second point. We grow spiritually with God when we get on the fast track with Jesus. The problem with the Christianity that we know, Western Christianity, heavily influenced by, um, uh, by uh, the enlightenment, enlightenment presuppositions and ideas, very heavily cognitive. The problem with Western Christianity is that it depends or it spends too much time in the slow track of the mind. The left brain stuff. This slow track functioning of our mind focuses on details but often misses the big picture. It can only see what it sees, what it's studying. And this slow functioning of the mind focuses on on mastery of information on logical thought. It focuses mainly on rational belief even, which I'm here to tell you is, is, is a good thing. Doctrines are good things, but I'm here also to tell you, but if you've been studying doctrines for, for all of your Christian life and you're still where you are, the good news for you is that um, you can still grow, but not by using doctrines to grow. It has its own limits. This slow track functioning of our mind focuses on details and often misses the big picture. It focuses on on, on mastery, on doctrines and, and rational belief, good as they are. Every single one of them. And we must study them. Once again, I I, I was telling this to uh, sharing some of this to Jeff, and he says, you know, we shouldn't be pitting left brain and right brain as though they're enemies of each other. And they're not. And I'm not saying we should only be using right brain because we've been used to using left brain only. We we should be using both. There's a place for both. But we're we're told that real transformation happens in the fast track of your mind, not in the slow track. Neuroscientists tell us that spiritual growth happens where you can, you you know, you 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 your mind thinks faster than you can actually gather your thoughts. What this means to us practically is this, that if we rely on the slow track of the mind for spiritual growth, we will always be playing catch-up and looking back to what we've just done, how we just blew our top. We've all been here before, right? You blow your top when the going gets, uh, gets rough. And then... You think about what you just did, what you just did, and then you try to bring Jesus in there and you say, Lord, I'm so sorry I did this. I don't know why I did it. But the harm has already been done. Our conscious thought was too slow to prevent us from blowing our top. Because it thinks in the slow track. It has stored our our, our, and our character is stored in the fast track of our mind, not in the slow track. And our character periodically will show up when we're under duress. Before we can even think about what we've just done or what, what, what we've just said. And when we do, our character has already done its damage and our character is running circles around our conscious mind. And the conscious mind cannot catch up. We used to have a dog. And the dog was so nimble. And we had a, an English bulldog, uh, you know, uh, next door to us or across the, across the street from us. And they would run together, play together. And my, you know, my Bichon Frise would run circles over this poor British bulldog. Couldn't catch her, couldn't touch her. You want to grow. And you will be frustrated by staying with your conscious mind only. Because your character will run circles around your conscious mind. And you will not be able, you will not be able to change. 
The problem is that our fast track mind not only runs circles around our slow, our slow track, it is also extremely hard to access. Why? Because, because the, right, you know, the, the right brain, where this is all stored, by the way, this fast track of the mind, keeps our character locked in a safe where nobody can touch it except those people whom we love. Those are the ones who can touch us in our very character. No amount of studying in the slow track will open the safe. No amount of end time speculations will open the safe. No amount of rational thought will open this space. Why? Because only the people that we love can open it. People we love and people we value. Which leads us now to our third point. The third point is this. We grow spiritually with God when we let Jesus into our fireproof safe. It is not enough to simply be, a, be able to listen to the still small voice of Jesus coming to us in the slow track. The key to mutual mind, our mind's ability to synchronize with the mind of Christ in thought and feeling and energy and motivation and action, the key is to let him into the safe box. And you know what the one thing is that lets him in? Love. Love is the only thing in this universe powerful enough to change, our, to change a person provided you love the right persons or you love the one person who is greater than your mind by infinite degrees. And to us Christians, there's only one person in the universe that qualifies. Who is it? Jesus. You cannot simply be studying about Jesus you must let him in to the fireproof safe of your mind where your character is stored. Or you can be wishing spiritual growth goodbye. To, mo- to motivate a person, to make a person, or to move heaven and earth, to pursue the goal that you want for yourself, all of those things, all of those things can happen only if you open your safe to the one you love. I was watching this video on YouTube um, over and over again this week. It was such a fascinating story. It happened somewhere in the, in the country of France. Nicholas was seven years old when he met the love of his life. Wow, that's pretty early. I'm not trying to encourage your kids uh, one way or the other. But, but, but Nicholas, at seven years old, he met the love of his life. Um, and guess in what grade? He was in fifth, I'm sorry, first grade. First, second grade, something like that. They were in the same class in Strasbourg, France. And for a year and a half, they got to know each other playing. They, were, they became good friends. It was very clear they liked each other a lot. And, and then the girl left and moved away because his, her parents got divorced to a city called Bordeaux, 10 hours away by train, about as far as Reading is from San Diego, from San Diego, a little bit farther than that. Um, and so, you know, they lost track over the years, right? Actually, they lost track quite quickly. And um, Nicholas was deeply hurt by this move because, you know, they really liked each other. And not a day went by for years, not a day went by, Nicholas says, I, that I did not think of her. And he searched for her, just no luck. She lost, she lost to him, she th- he thought. And then he watched a TV show one day about people, you know, reconnecting people with each other. And, and so Nicholas took a chance, and, and he called the show. And maybe they can find uh, her. And, and so they searched for this girl. Her name was Danielle. And finally, they did uh, uh, see, uh, find her. And, and, and then um, Nicholas and Danielle finally reconnected on live TV 12 years after they last saw each other. 12 years. I mean, when you're in elementary and you see each other 12 years afterwards, will you re- recognize that person? Your first love? Nicholas and Danielle finally reconnected, and, and in their reunion, Danielle, now a beautiful young pharmacist, revealed that she too was deeply hurt 
by their separation. And that she never stopped thinking of him as well, wondering whether he had been, uh, he had been the one or not. And so she, um, when, when they finally you know, uh, showed each other's faces on, on the TV screen, she struggled to recognize, um, to recognize um, Nicholas. And then she, she started saying, you know, it's hard, hard. And, and, then, and then finally she says, I do recognize him, but there's been an evolution. I mean, he's, he's changed. But he's, you know, she says, I recognize him, yes, yes. From elementary, he was my first love that I have never forgotten. And everybody just erupted. Everybody just erupted. And, um, and then she says, well, you know, he was my first love that I've never forgotten. And, but, you know, his eyes are the same. His eyes are the same. And, and then she says, he's as charming as ever. And everybody erupted again. Uh, a beautiful story to, to watch over and over again, and I did. Sorry, so it's had like three million views and probably minus about a thousand of those views. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's such a lovely story. Um, and, and, and as Nicholas told his story to her, she, she started to cry. And she looked at him tenderly, and Nicholas expressed his desire to get to know each other once again. And, and, and he says, perhaps we can rekindle the past. Old flame. But Daniel had a choice. And if she said no, there was a curtain that separated them, that curtain would remain. But if she said yes, the curtain would be pulled back and they would be reunited again. And finally, at the end of the show, Daniel says, pull that curtain back. And they did. And they embraced. And the um, the audience erupted once again. And the show ended. Nicholas and Danielle found each other at last. Love is the only force powerful enough to motivate anyone to want to do what Nicholas and Danielle did. And for us Christians, it is the one force powerful enough to motivate us and to cause cause us to change. And for us Christians, there's only one person that qualifies, that is a greater mind to whom we can center our thoughts that can change us if we let him into our firewall safe. And that person is no other than Jesus Christ himself. But if Jesus is only in the slow track of your mind, you can think about uh, spiritual growth. But your character, whatever the state of your character is, will always frustrate you, and you will not change. In the first place, you cannot change on your own. You need someone greater than you. And that person is Jesus Christ. Your um, character will run circles around your conscious mind and it will frustrate you. And you will always be playing catch up. And your prayers will always be, oh Lord, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. And then you do it again. Sorry, Lord, I won't do it again. (laughs) We've all been there before. You cannot change from the slow track. You can only change by letting somebody into your fireproof safe. Which leads us to the final point. How do you think with Jesus in the fast track? Well, this is, this is where you know, the sermon takes a turn to you know, the practical side of things. Number four. That should be, yeah, that's number four. Is that number four? We grow up spiritually with God when we make room for Jesus all day every day. And this is where I, what, I, what I said, this is where practice comes in. The various disciplines of the spiritual life. I, had, I asked uh, uh, two of our, of, our, of our boys here to uh, pass out this uh, um, the sheet of paper with some of the key practices of Jesus Christ, right? So, in other words, you know, we're not going to go through this. I just want you to take this home and study it. And um, I'm here to tell you that we need all the disciplines, Jesus' disciplines, of the spiritual life. Um, but, you know, they have their purpose. And um, the purpose of the, the, the various practices of the, spiritual, of the spiritual life is not to make us holier. As a matter of fact, none of these practices, including prayer, yes, quote me, 
including prayer, including being here on Sabbath worshiping, has no value whatsoever. It is not inherently good. Nothing about it is inherently good if we miss Jesus along the way. There is a frequent mistake that we make. We think that the various practices of the spiritual life, like worship, prayer, fasting, service, are morally good in and of themselves. The more we do them, the more God will be pleased with us. Well, I don't know about that. There's really a big mistake here. And, and, and here's a surprise for you once again. None of these things will do, spirit, will do you any spiritual good, including being here th- today, this Sabbath day, if you miss Jesus in the process. It is not coming to church on Sabbath that is morally good. It is you encountering Jesus here on Sabbath that makes the experience good. But you utilize all of these practices to make room. You pray to make room. You fast to make room so that you and Jesus can engage in a conversation as friends. Years ago, a young, passionate, bright young man comes to me in my office with his beautiful wife, and they, were, they had been frequenting the church I was a pastor in uh, for, for a, f- you know, f- a good few months at that time, and the church was in need of a youth pastor, and so we started to look for a, a youth pastor, um, and he was interested, and, and I said, well, okay, you're interested, sure, I'll let you know when the, when the right time comes, and the right time came, and we were able to find two applicants for, 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 the, for the job, and, and, and this guy being one of them. They came for this man to be interviewed, and, and asked him, hey, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine, I'm, thank you, and how, so how do you feel about this whole thing? And, and he says, well, I feel very confident, because I've been praying, and I've fasted several days. The Lord will answer my prayer. But the church went another direction and picked the other guy. And the man and his wife weren't very happy with that experience, as a matter of fact. And they caused headache and division in the church afterwards. For two and a half years of the rest of our stay there in that church, they made things awfully hard on all of us. Why is that? Because Jesus Christ had not made it all the way to the safe box to the fireproof safe of their heart. It is sad. When Jesus is kept outside the fireproof safe, it's sadder still when all of Jesus' practices of the spiritual life are given value apart from a living encounter with Jesus Christ. Only the person himself, Jesus, can transform us and can grow us spiritually. Without Jesus, kiss everything goodbye. He is the one that grows us spiritually until he comes and even beyond forever. Let him in and he'll take care of you. Right, let us pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.